now in a later model JK, I'm not sure what year, I think it's about a 14. 40s, 1 tons, LS3, the whole thing. So let's start with the secondary air system because I think it's one of the most misunderstood. What is secondary air? Well, primary air is what goes into the intake and supports combustion. When I was a missions inspector, I trained for the practical test. The practical test is where you actually have to go take a test at the lab. And the guys at the lab want to hear a short answer when asked, what does something do? The short answer for what does secondary air do was it completes combustion. How does it complete combustion? What do you have in the fire triangle? Think of your campfire. You've got heat, fuel, and air. So let's distill that down to spark, gasoline, and oxygen. In the combustion chamber, not all the volatile elements burn. Well, if you have hydrocarbons and COs, they're still burnable. They get into the exhaust, and what do you have? You've got heat, and you've got fuel. What are we missing? Air. So that's exactly what secondary air does, is we introduced air or oxygen into the exhaust system and that helps burn off remaining COs and HCs in the combustion chamber. You got to be careful with the secondary air system because while it can do a lot of good, it can also do some harm. Because we're putting air into the exhaust system, the secondary air system has to deal with heat and that can be a little bit tricky. There's different ways of doing it. We'll talk about the two main systems. There's pulse air and pump air. Pulse air basically means that they use the vacuum created from the exhaust stream to pull fresh air into the exhaust. However, that's not as efficient as a pump air system. A pump air system actually uses a pump, and it can be a belt driven or an electric pump to force air into the exhaust system. Both of these systems use what's called a check valve, and that's to keep the exhaust gas from going back into the system. Check valves, if working properly, protect the system from damage. However, when not working properly, they can go upstream and melt things like your diverter valves. I remember back in the 80s, that was pretty popular with the Fords, watching the Ford vans go down the street backfiring. And we're gonna talk about that because a lot of times the diverter valve is called the, the anti-backfire valve. What we have in the exhaust is a lot of heat and fuel. Now when I say a lot of fuel, you look at the old carbureted vehicles from the 1980s that had secondary air systems. If you were going, let's say, down a long grade like the Baker grade, and you were off the throttle, you were still pulling fuel in through the transfer ports. And that fuel was just accumulating the exhaust manifold. So when you introduce oxygen into that chamber or into that exhaust system, with all that fuel and heat, kaboom, you get an explosion. And I've seen mufflers blown clean off vehicles because of this. So we got to be careful about how much and when we put air into the exhaust. Most of the diverter valves would divert air away from the exhaust under conditions of high intake manifold vacuum. So that would be idle, decelerating, coasting like we talked about. Under a heavy load, you can put air into the exhaust and burn those bad gases off with little risk of a backfire. In the early days, the pump systems were pretty complex. By the 90s, especially with the Europeans, they started to use electric air pumps. Electric air pumps could be more efficient. They weren't belt driven, so you had a lot less complexity. The pulse air systems could be very simple or very complex. Basically, you use a solenoid to open a valve up that would then use the negative vacuum inside the exhaust to pull air into the system. One of the concerns with a pulse air system was the volume of air that you could put into the exhaust. Let's fast forward because basically the LS motors deleted the air systems way back. Now there still are some, some vehicles that use secondary air, but it's getting less and less as time goes by. I remember back in the 80s and 90s, almost everything ran it. Probably what is the most complicated, most understood, and most troublesome of the emission systems, and that's the EGR valve. What is an EGR valve? Exhaust gas recirculation. Well, why do we want to recirculate the exhaust gas into the intake manifold? Remember we talked about the two-line answer for the lab. What does an EGR valve do? It reduces NOx. Now it can do other things. It could be called an anti-NOx valve and other things, but that's its primary reason. We talked about California in the 1960s and the fact that they were leaning the motors out, leaning the motors out, and the smog kept getting worse. At least it wasn't getting better. So what was going on? There's a gas called NOx, and NOx is the formation of nitrogen and oxygen when you melt them together under high temperatures. 
So we're breathing free nitrogen right now and free oxygen, and when those melt together, they can turn into a bad gas. The X stands for the number of oxygen atoms. It could be NO1, NO2, NO3. There are specific NOx elements that when released into the atmosphere create what's called photochemical smog. They combine with sunlight and create that brown haze that we see. It's called photochemical smog. How do we reduce NOx? Well, we learned by leaning the combustion chambers out that the chamber got hotter and hotter, especially if you were to go up a long grade. If you ever look at the feds monitoring for emissions, they're usually on some sort of a long grade. And the reason is they want that engine under a heavy load for a long period of time because that's when these emissions, especially NOx emissions, are formed. In order to create NOx, we need high temperature, say about 2,500 degrees. And that's how hot your combustion chamber can get when under a heavy load. This is the reason why we have to dyno test for NOx. If you look at emissions analyzers, you can have a three or a four gas analyzer that looks for O2, CO2, HC, and CO, and we're mainly looking for CO and HC as the harmful gases. Remember, CO is partially burned fuel, HC is raw fuel. But there's another gas that we want to look for, and that's NOx, NOx. The problem with looking for NOx is you can't just have a vehicle sitting still revving the motor up because you're not under a load. So by putting it on a dyno, we can load that motor down, get the chamber temperatures up, and then look for NOx. Chrysler experimented with some fixed orifice systems that were pretty simple. There were negative pressure, positive pressure EGR systems, but basically what we did is we took the gas that's in the exhaust, and we talked about volatile and inert, and the gas in the exhaust is for the most part inert, which means it doesn't want to burn. Yeah, we did say that there's some trace HCs and COs that can still burn, and we put oxygen in there to finish those off but for the most part if you look at what's in the exhaust versus what's in the intake it's inert so by introducing these inert gases into the chamber we can cool it down because now there's not as much fuel and air to burn and EGR valves became very popular almost everything started to run it we saw the Europeans and the Americans and the Japanese we all ran EGR valves and some of the systems just got out of control I remember some of the early Toyota and Lexuses ran exhaust gas temperature sensors. Some of the California vehicles ran exhaust gas temperature sensors where the other vehicles didn't for the better control of the of the EGR system. And of course diesels run NOx because diesels, as you know, basically run off of pre-ignition. So they're building high pressures up which create NOx. And this is one of the problems with the modern diesel is the reduction of NOx. You have all these different systems and filters designed to reduce NOx. If you could free the diesel up from the NOx emissions, it would be an extremely efficient engine. But because of the because of emissions, we're really choking these diesels down. So getting back to how do we control NOx, so we put an EGR valve on. In the early days, most of the EGR valves were vacuum controlled, which basically meant you used a solenoid that was controlled by the computer to open up a valve that would then release exhaust gas into the intake manifold. And as you can imagine, taking this exhaust gas that's really hot and then putting it back into an intake manifold could be troublesome. Carbon would build up in the intake tracks and then the EGR valve would become ineffective. Hoses and pipes connected to the valve could melt because of the temperatures. I remember some of the old 4.6 Fords had long thin passages that we had to use pipe cleaners on. And for some reason, manufacturers had the habit of mounting the EGR valves back underneath the firewall. Uh, I remember Ford did that, Chrysler's doing that with a JK. There were some that weren't, like some of the small block Fords, those were nice, they were right out in front. So EGR valves, like everything else involved, originally they were pretty primitive, and under high loads they would just let the exhaust gas into the intake. They used little discs to restrict how much flow would go into the intake based on the engine size, and different EGR valves sometimes came with different little shims that you could replace for different flow rates. So they were pretty primitive. Of course, as time went on, we got more and more sophisticated. We started sensing the exhaust gas temperature for better feedback. Then electronic EGR valves came out, digital and linear. Linear EGR valves could be open however much you want, 5%, 10%, 20%. And by the 90s, most of the engines went to that. They were much more precise. You could put as much exhaust gas as you want into the intake. It was used for anti-knock and, of course, for reduction of knocks and they were very effective. 
So if you look at the modern LS, at least the Gen 4s, you'll notice that not many of them are running EGR valves. A lot of the Gen 3s did run EGR valves. But by carefully designing the combustion chambers and combining technologies, the EGR valve has been eliminated on most of the modern production V8 GM engines. Chrysler is still staying with an EGR valve, and I'm sure there's reasons for that on the pet start. But fortunately, we have eliminated the EGR valve. If you look at the new JL, not only do you have an EGR valve, exhaust gas temperature sensor, EGR valve cooler, there's just a lot of stuff going on there. They are even water cooling it now. So the complexity of this system is going to be troublesome in the future, in my opinion. By going to variable valve timing, that helped a lot because now we can control cylinder pressure a lot better. Remember, it's cylinder pressure and temperature that creates knots. Phasing the cam, and the Gen 5s can do this even better, we have control of cylinder pressure, hence temperatures, hence knots formation. So GM has limited the EGR valve, and I think it's great. I don't like dealing with pipes coming out the exhaust that are really hot and having to clean valves and passages out. As a general mechanic, we used to install these plates on EGR valve passages and let the intake suck through the cleaner because it was almost impossible to get to some of these passages that were deep down inside the intake. Just very, very troublesome systems.